My name is Alexander Smith. I've kept my silence on this issue for a long time. A long, long time. What I'm about to tell you is something that I haven't even told my children, nor my grandchildren. My own wife doesn't even know what I'm about to tell you. You see, the reason I kept my silence for so long was due to the threats that I got if I exposed my story and if I told what happened, if I told the truth. They wouldn't let me tell the truth, and they're not going to like this at all. But I couldn't live with myself one more day if I kept it all sealed up. The only way I can live with myself from now on is if I tell the truth about what happened. And I suppose my story starts back in the year 1981. You see, I had a background in the military. I rose up the ranks and eventually I worked for the CIA. I can't give my specific position in the CIA due to the fact that they would know who I am. I realize that most people watching this right now, they're gonna dismiss this. They're gonna think I'm making up a story for attention. I just wanna say to everybody who's watching this, that's not me. <laughs> I've wanted to tell the truth for so long. My story starts back in the year 1981. I had previously worked for the CIA, but at the time in 1981, I was working a local job as a car repairman. I had nothing to do with the CIA. I had nothing to do with the military at this time. I had previously been in the military and I had worked for the CIA. But at the time, in 1981, I was doing neither. <sighs> I remember the day. I remember the day clearly. I was sitting at home with my wife on the couch, watching television. When I got a knock at the door, I went to the door to answer it. And outside were two men dressed in black suits. When I opened the door, they asked me to come with them. They worked for the CIA. They told me to go with them, so I complied. I, I, I took a seat in the back of their truck. They told me I couldn't even tell my wife that I was leaving. So I left her, sitting on the couch. I wasn't to see her for a long time. On the car ride, they explained to me that they can't tell me exactly where we're going. They told me to put on a blindfold so I couldn't know the exact location of where we were going. Eventually, the car stopped, and I began to hear helicopter blades going. They told me to keep coming with them, and at the time, I was still wearing a blindfold. And soon thereafter, we were in a helicopter flying. After what I would estimate would be about 45 minutes, the helicopter landed. They took off my blindfold. And they told me we were in a top secret military base. They couldn't tell me the exact location of which where I was. A few different men wearing black suits ushered me into an underground facility at the base. Now remember, I haven't a clue where this base was. They brought me underground. I had to climb down a very long ladder that went deep underground. And eventually we reached the bottom. I looked around and I saw a very long hallway. They told me to come with them down the hallway. Now having worked for the Central Intelligence Agency, I had a little bit of an idea of what we were doing. You see, back when I worked for the CIA, they were telling me about this one project. 
in which they would test the limits of space and time itself. And they were working with top scientists on how to solve some of the biggest issues facing our Earth. I wasn't exactly sure what, but I had remembered that I had previously signed up. Now remind you, this was around 10 years before. I worked for the CIA in the 1970s, and they come get me around 10 years later. After walking down this long hallway, there was a room on the right side. They told me to come into the room, and inside the room I saw this contraption with wires, and it was made of metal. Very big contraption. It was a big cube. Wires sticking out gauges on the side. I didn't know exactly what to think of it. And I remember clear as day. One of the scientists came up. And he told the other men wearing the black suits that they could leave. And they stepped out of the room and closed the door. It was just me and this one scientist inside the room. The scientist, he told me. This is a time machine. Obviously, I was in shock. Now, I knew the CIA had developed previous technologies before they came out. It's just how it is. The technologies that you're using right now, like smartphones, they were developed around 30 years prior to them actually being released. So you can only imagine what technologies they have right now. Upon that man telling me it was a time machine, he soon told me that I was going to be the first test subject. I was going to be the first one. He told me there was a high probability of me getting hurt or dying. And that I could not opt out. He reminded me of when I signed up as a test subject for advanced technologies. I complied. He had me put on this metal helmet in which there was only a small slit in which I could look out. He said this was to help protect from the radiation involved. I also had to put on this tin suit to also help prevent radiation. He told me the main concern in doing this test was radiation. Now you see, we didn't know exactly what was going to happen. We didn't know if it would work. Sat me in a small room and we had many meetings. I had meetings with various scientists telling me what to expect, telling me what to do during the process of the actual time traveling itself. They told me what to do. They told me to lay still. You see, in the contraption, you had to lay down on your back and they would pick you up on a stretcher and slide you into this one slot. Inside the slot it was pitch black once they closed the door to the slot. And I hadn't a clue what was inside of there, what was about to happen to me. After having various meetings about what was going to happen, we decided it was finally time to go through with it. And we were ready for the initial test. I went inside of the machine, as we had previously tested and as we had previously rehearsed. I felt as if I was ready. They told me that if they were ever successful in getting me back, that I could never tell my wife, nor my children, nor my grandchildren, nor nobody. The last thing they want is for me talking to you right now, here today. But I'm going to tell you about my story. So upon being put inside the time machine, it was pitch black and pitch silent. I couldn't hear a thing. Eventually, after about five minutes of being inside of there, I started to feel lightheaded. And suddenly, there was flashes of bright light that seemed to be inside my own eyelids. I looked around, laying on my back. And I could see nothing, just white light flashing in my eyes every couple seconds. 
eventually I went unconscious. It was, it was sort of like a fading out. My consciousness sort of faded out. And then I woke up. I was lying on a hospital bed. I thought something had gone wrong with the experiment and I was still in the year 1981. I looked around and I was alone in my room. I was alone in this room and there was a window to my left side. To the left side of the hospital bed there was a window and there were drapes on that window. So I couldn't see out it, but I knew it was daytime because there was light peeking in. After looking at the window, I looked right ahead of me, and in front of me was something that I've never seen before. It was a glass screen. It looked as if it was a piece of glass hovering a couple of inches in front of the wall. Now, I figured this was inside of some sort of military hospital that they had developed advanced technology the public was not aware of. But as I looked around, I saw some things that were very strange, very different, to say the least. I looked to my left side, and sitting next to the hospital bed was a table. The table was glass, and I could see right through it, and I could see the ground. Now this table, it was simply a tabletop, a glass tabletop floating, and I could see nothing outside supporting it, floating approximately two feet off of the ground. And on top of this glass tabletop, there was a couple of cups. One of them appeared as if it was full of water. Now, this wasn't any sort of advanced technology that we had in our present year of 1981. Eventually, a nurse walked into the room I was staying in. It was the first person I've seen after this incident. And she began to explain everything to me. She said I was found on the side of the road unconscious. She thought I had gotten in some sort of car accident or something, and I told her about my story. I told her what had happened, and she asked me. She said, what was the date in which this happened? And I told her it was in the year 1981. And I'll never forget what she said back. She said, sir, it's 2118. And I said, 2118. I thought she was referencing the military time. But she said, sir, don't you know the year? It's 2118. I didn't believe what she was saying at first. I didn't think this actually worked. But given the circumstances that led up to it, I began to accept this. I think she, along with everybody else in that hospital who talked to me, they thought I was crazy. They thought I was making up my story. She said, sir, why don't you watch some TV and get your mind off this? So I saw a remote control different from any kind of remote control I've seen in 1981. On the side, sitting on that glass table as well, I picked up the remote control and there was a power button on the top. I hit that button and the glass that was floating in front of the wall, it turned into a, it turned into a screen. And there was television shows I never heard of playing on that screen. And when I switched to one of the news channels, I read the date. The date read November 17th, 2118. This was hard to believe. It was hard to accept. I thought I was in a dream. And yet nobody in the future believed me. I realized I had to get out of this hospital. I was completely fine. I felt okay. So I got out of my hospital bed. And I noticed a chip on my on the bottom side of my wrist. A chip and it and and what I assumed that chip was for was for monitoring my heart rate and all the other vitals. 
So I walked up to, so I got up out of my hospital bed and I walked up to the window. I opened the window and I saw a city. It ain't like any other city I've ever seen before. This city was very large. I saw vehicles flying at the tops of the skyscrapers. I had to leave. I had to see what was going on. At this time, I began to accept my fate. I may never see my wife again. So I walked to the door of that hospital room and I found that it was unlocked. So I opened the door. I was still wearing the same exact clothes in which I was wearing in the year 1981. I walked out of that room and I walked down the long hallway. I noticed an elevator. And the elevator looked nearly the exact same as the elevators that you see today. The buttons maybe looked a little bit more futuristic. But apart from that, it looked like any standard elevator. I got in that elevator and I hit the button to go to floor one. Apparently I was on floor six. I will admit the elevator was quite fast and I was on floor one before I knew it. The glass doors of the elevator opened and I saw the lobby of this hospital in which I was in. Nearly everybody appeared to be dressed in white. They were all wearing white clothes and they appeared to be looking at me strangely. I went up to the front desk of this hospital and I asked the lady who was standing there who was wearing all blue. The patients appeared to be all wearing white clothes, but this lady who was working at the front desk was wearing all blue. And it appeared as if all the other hospital employees were also wearing these blue uniforms. Not like the blue uniforms you'd see in a hospital today. They were blue long sleeve shirts, blue pants of the same color. And I asked the lady, where am I? And she tells me, you're in District 508. And I said, District 508, what does that mean? And she says, what do you mean, what does that mean? Where well, you're in District 508. I began to question everything. Where was I? I went up to the front of the hospital. I went to the front doors, which was sliding glass doors. And they open automatically when I walk through. And I saw the and I realized I was on the outskirts of the city. This city with buildings I ain't never seen before. And I saw a sign saying District 508. And at the bottom of the sign I read in very small text. It said, District 508 of the Yavis Empire. I realized I was not in the United States. I was in a new place. I didn't know what this Yavis Empire meant, but I knew I had to come home. So I walked around the city a bit. It's a very strange city. I looked above me and I could see buses floating in the sky. I wasn't sure about how any of the technology worked, but I saw buses and cars flying in the sky above me. The streets down low were open. You could walk. Anybody could walk, and it was full of pedestrians and people biking, and... But there was no cars at the base level. All the cars and all the other transportation was above, going in between the skyscrapers. And meant much of the skyscrapers appeared to be made of glass. They were all very transparent. And they were all very tall. Much taller than any skyscraper you'd see in New York. So I realized I was in the year 2118. I had no clue of where I was or if I would ever get back to see my family again. In accordance to seeing people walking on the very base level of, this, of these streets, which were essentially one giant sidewalk in between all of the buildings in which people could walk on. In accordance to seeing people on these giant sidewalks, or streets. I also saw robots. And such robots appeared to be floating a foot or two off the ground. And 
they appeared to look quite like humans, except they didn't have legs and they were floating up off the ground. I went up to a random man on the street and I says to him, you need to listen to me. I know you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you, but I'm a time traveler. And he simply says to me, okay, as if he hears it every day. And I ask him, what year was time travel developed? And he tells me it was developed in the year 2028. 2028, he says. And he says, no, I'm a time traveler. And I travel from the year 1981. He looks at me strangely and he says, but they taught me time travel was developed. So both of us were confused. I had to get back. So upon walking around, I, I went up to one of the robots and I says, excuse me. And it turns around and looks at me. It looked like any other ordinary person except it didn't have legs and it was floating off the ground. And it turns around and looks at me. And I says, how, excuse me, how can I time travel? And the robot says, well, sir, you need to go to the nearest time travel agency. And I says, time travel agency, where can I find that? And she gave me this little glass tablet type of thing, and it had directions on it. And it, it was updated in real time as I was walking with it. It had a purple line guiding me to my location, essentially a small map on a piece of glass, very lightweight. And it also appeared to be scratch resistant. So I followed the line in real time and it brought me down a couple streets. A few blocks away there was this one building. Not the biggest building, but still a skyscraper nonetheless. And I saw a red time travel agency across the top of the building. So I went inside this building and there was a man at the counter. I wasn't sure if it was really a man or if it was one of them robots. But the robots, they, they appeared to talk in the same manner that people do. I couldn't distinguish any one of them robots apart from the people if it weren't for the fact that they were floating a couple feet off the ground and that they didn't have legs. So I asked the man at the front desk of this time travel agency, I says, I need to travel to the year 1981. And he says, that'll be $457. The scientists have given me around $50,000 to bring into the future to bring with me time traveling just in case I would need it. So I gave him my money not knowing if it would be accepted, if they would accept US dollars in cash. And he slid it into a machine without saying a word and it appeared as if he took it. He gave me some change back and it ended up costing me around $6,000. And I ask the man, Sir, what is the Yavis Empire? And he says back to me, It's where you are right now. He said, You're in a district. How don't you know this? You seem to be dressed differently too. And I didn't think anybody wanted me to tell anybody in the future, but I told him anyway about my situation, how I, I was a time traveler from the year 1981. He had a skeptical look on his face, but I think he believed me deep down. So I get into a very fancy, white and blue type of machine with no windows on it, a white and blue rectangular prism, very large. You could see maybe, maybe 50 people. And I was the only one going into this machine. He brought me up a couple flats of stairs to get into it. And I sat down in it, and it began to shake. And eventually, I once again went unconscious. And I woke up on the side of the street in Los Angeles. It appeared as if it appeared back in 1981. And I thought it had maybe worked. And I go around and I ask a few homeless people, what year am I in? And he tells me 1981, so it appears as if it had worked. You see, the issue here is I lived on the other side of the United States, so, so I simply took a flight to get back home.
and I was contacted by the Central Intelligence Agency not too long after. And they asked me all, they once again took me from my home and I could not tell my wife any of this. They asked me all sorts of questions and I told them everything I knew. You see, I also had a bag with me that I was going to take a camera and upon other things, food and anything else I might need. However, the bag was not successful in being teleported, for lack of a better word, into the future. It was only me my clothes and everything on my clothes in my pockets which is where I kept my cash I told them everything I knew and I had to swear and I had to swear to them that I would never tell anybody you see I couldn't live with myself anymore and I had to tell people about this so just so my family and everybody else out there knows the truth I think the truth is the most important thing and I want to thank you for listening to my story because my sole goal from now on is to tell the truth. Whether that truth may be hard to believe for some people or not, I'm unsure of whether they'll hunt me down and find me. Yes, thank you for having me. It was nice to meet you.